And today we have two uh, papers. Uh, will both be presenting along the lines of longevity risk management uh, using some innovative mathematical framework uh, for the purpose of indexation hedging. So I'll invite our first speaker. Okay. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Kenneth Zhou. I'm from the Arizona State University. And this is a work with uh, two of my co-authors, Professor Johnny Lee and Professor Wee San Chen. Okay. And the title of my talk is Quantification and Management of Longevity Risk in China. Well, very first question will be, why China? Okay. So the topics on China, well, more specifically on the longevity risk in China, but why China? Well, here are some general information for that. Uh, in the past 20 to 30 years, China has made tremendous improvement or achievement in mortality. Okay. Uh, you can see here for the general population, the life expectancy at birth for males uh, increased from 57 to 74 from uh, 1970 to 2017. Uh, 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 and then the same goes uh, with females as well. And then this improvement is more remarkable in the pension industry. Okay? So the bottom two numbers are for pension insurers. Okay, life, life expectancy for female and males over the last 20 year period from 1990 to 2010 increased by more than four, uh, more than four years per decade. Okay, this is a number that is faster than a typical rate of improvement in the Western world. Okay, and this is certainly some great news for China. However, this also proposed some challenges to the pension system in China. And like many uh, countries, China also has a three-pillar system for its, pension, for, for its public uh, pension system. We have a mandatory public managed uh, pillar, pillar one, and then another uh, mandatory privately managed pillar, pillar, three, uh, pillar two, and then a voluntary uh, self-managed pillar, pillar number three. And the pillar one is a DB plan PDN is a DB plan uh, founded by both employers and employees. And it's a, gov a government plan. And because it's a DB plan, you should pr give some protection to, uh, to the employees. Okay, but this protection is actually not that big because the amount of pension from a public uh, managed plan from the government is not that big. Now for the second pillar, the second pillar is a DC plan, also known as the Enterprise Annuity. And this is also funded by both uh, employers and employees. But because it's a DC plan, its protection against longevity risk is none. Okay, and then um, when you retire in China, you are asked, you must withdraw this money from the account, either as a lump sum payment or putting into a fixed term uh, annuity, a fixed term uh, installments. That's pillar th two. And then for pillar three, so if nowhere to find uh, longevity protection, then people have to go to pillar three, which is known as the commercial annuity. So a typical normal life annuity market from insurance companies. So for protection of longevity risk from individual uh, point of view, uh, pillar number three. Okay. Now, because of this, the, the longevity or the, the life insurance market in China has grown rapidly over the last few decades. Here are some numbers supporting that. The total amount of life annuity purchase with individual savings has increased from 62.62.6 uh, billion yuan in 2006, which has increased to 150 billion in 2016. Okay, this is almost, uh, almost tripled in just 10 years. Okay? And another number that's supporting it is the total annuity benefit payouts. It was 14 billion in 2010, and now it has increased uh, to 85.3 billion yuan in 2017. Okay? And building on these two numbers is also uh, the pillar two that I mentioned before, is the annuity, uh, in, uh, the enterprise annuity. Okay, this number, the current accumulated fund amount is at 1.477 trillion yuan. 
And remember that when a person retires in China, they're asked to either withdraw this money in a lump sum or put this into uh, a fixed-term annuity or fixed-term installment. So this also indicates some potential future growth for the, the life insurance market in China. Okay, now, this is definitely, uh, uh, these situation also pose some risk, propose uh, uh, some risk, large risk in this, uh, for Chinese insurers. A large part of this longevity risk is, of course, uh, trend risk. This is a risk that will affect systematically every pensioner in China. And then in China, most of the insurance company also sells life insurance. So they both have life annuity and life insurance uh, products. Well, in that sense, um, there's probably an effect of natural hatching. However, this effect is probably not that uh, effective given a number of reasons such as differences in age profiles and uh, uh, other reasons. So uh, natural hatching may not work here. And building on, that, on top of that, there's also a the newly imposed uh, a regulation which specifically require each Chinese insurer to hold a longevity risk, uh, longevity risk solvency capital, similar, very similar to what we have with solvency to the more uh, the new uh, regulations, which I will go into detail later. Now the question is, if who can bear this risk, whether the government or someone else? Uh, the government is already taking some of this risk, or well, actually taking a large amount of risk because of Pillar 1. The Pillar 1 is a public managed uh, DB plan that's, a, that's for everyone in China. So the Ch Chinese government is already, support, uh, already consuming a large amount of this risk. They may not be able to further take this risk. So another candidate for this will be uh, capital markets. So capital market may be interested in taking this risk. Uh, for the benefit of uh, risk premium and maybe diversification effects as well. And then uh, the size of the Chinese capital market is also definitely large enough to consume uh, these longevity risks. Here I show some numbers that was collected in 2014 saying how big this market, or how big the capital market is uh, in China. So definitely large enough. Uh, to transfer these risks to capital market, a very important uh, problem we have to overcome is the misalignment of incentives between annuity providers and capital market insurers. Okay, one of the questions that we're, we're facing is uh, how can we build standardized mortality products that are built on standardized uh, mortality indexes so that people can have a fair trade or a equal knowledge on some products. Uh, so what the, one of the questions here is how can we have that, how can we have a mortality index, uh, a standardized products for China? There are also, ex there are already some existing indexes, uh, mortality indexes built, but in the Western world, okay? Their mortality experience are linked to Western world's experience as well. So, but with a population of that big, the, with the population of China, very huge, it might be worth to investigate whether China needs its own standardized mortality index. Okay. So that will also be a one well of the goal here. But this brings me to the contributions or the, the, the objective of this talk. Okay, the primary objective is to study the possibility of developing a market for standardized mortality link securities in China. Okay, to achieve this, I'm gonna break this down to three more specific goals. Okay. Number one is to how to quantify uh, longevity risk in China using a, a stochastic mortality model that is specifically designed for China, which I will talk about later that there are some data problems, very serious data problems in China that will uh, make this job or this goal harder. Uh, the second goal is to develop a dynamic, a dynamic hatching strategy for China, building on these building on a model that's built from goal one, okay? Which will be, uh, will be compatible with the situation, the data uh, in China we, we saw, we will, I will discuss later. And lastly, we wanna examine how, uh, how much solvency, solvency capital requirement can be released under a standard hatch that is built in goal two. 
uh, under the new CROS uh, regulations, which I also will discuss. Okay, and the rest of this talk will also be, will be uh, separated into those three parts, talking about each of the growth goals. Okay, first, a stochastic mortality model for China. Now, as I mentioned before, China has some serious data problems with, uh, with its historical mortality data. Well, to build a model, we need some historical mortality data. The two heat, heat maps here are showing the age and time-specific uh, availability of the data and the source of the data. Okay, so have a year here and then age on the other side. It's clear here that uh, both female and male are missing a number of years of data completely. Okay, so those are great areas. That means there's no data for those years completely. And also for some old age groups for some years, the data are also missing. Okay, the gray area over there. And on top of that, we also see that these data, the data that are available to us are also collected from different sources with different level of sampling uncertainty. Okay, the blue ones are the census data. That's the whole country. But we only have four years of those. And there are also the orange one, which are from a 1% of the whole population survey data. We have uh, three years of those. And for all the rest, it's a 0.1% survey data of the whole country. So from this, you can see that there are missing data. There are a lot of missing data, short amount of data, and also a different source, different level of sampling risk from this whole data set. Okay, so we're gonna try to build a stochastic mortality model on top of this uh, data set. To do so, we consider a Bayesian version of the, of the classical Lee Carter model. But in this uh, model, we let the error term to have a time-specific variance, and then uh, the time-varying trend kappa will be following a normal uh, random walk with drift. Okay. And then we will formulate this whole model into a Gaussian uh, state space for formula, treating the time varying trends as the latent uh, variable. So it will be a Bayesian setup now. And then to estimate this model, we're going to also use a number of Bayesian estimation techniques. Okay, we're going to use uh, we use uh, the Gibbs sampling, which is a standard Bayesian estimation techniques to draw some post posterior. Uh, uh, to solve some, draw some samples from the posterior distribution. And to solve the, uh, the missing data problem, we use uh, imputation. So we use our model to predict some numbers for those missing data points and fill in those data points to remodel and then, and then run this full model into the Bayesian setup again to generate a full data set. Uh, to solve those uh, many missing years at different time points, we also use a technique called sequential comma filter, okay, which will retreat uh, the hidden variables one by one instead of looking at the whole map. So that way we can uh, skip some of the missing years. And then uh, to deal with uh, the different level of uncertainty or the large amount of uncertainty sampling uncertainty in it, we also use a cubic spline function to smooth the age-specific parameters a and a of x and b of x using a qubit b spline function. Now I will not go further into uh, the estimation methods but show you the results directly. Now here are the typical alpha, beta, or a, b, and k of a Lee Carter model. Uh -huh. These are posterior distribution plotted in fan charts. Uh, a of x, very typical shape, very typical shape. Of and then, but compared to uh, A of X, look at B of X, there is a large amount of parameter uncertainty in the posterior distribution. The width of the fan chart is clearly larger than A of X. Okay, that's some parameter uncertainty there. And also, they're all, all, both smooth. The trend is smooth. That's because of the B spine function we use. And lastly, for kappa, it has a downward trend. Okay, that's very typical. But looking at the uncertainty in the kappa parameter, it's quite large for some years. Those here are the missing years that I showed you earlier. So in a Bayesian setup, it's able to capture that for those missing years, the uncertainty are larger. The parameter risk is larger. So we have a larger width in the fan chart. But for other years, it's going down, but with some uncertainty, with some trend risk in it. 
this, uh, these are two histograms showing the drift term, C, and also the variance of the kappa term, the variance of the time varying, uh, time varying per trend. And one thing we can know that, notice that is the variance is very large. It could be very large, 20 or 80, even 100. And then another thing about the trend is that the trend in this distribution could be positive because of the larger amount of uncertainty in it. So we have a distribution covering both negative and positive values. Okay, that's the model. Now building on this model, I, uh, we can develop a hatch. But first let me talk about uh, the hatching instrument we're gonna use. We assume that there's a zero coupon swap that will exchange a fixed amount with a uh, random amount. Okay, so one, pers one, one party pays a random amount and the other party pays a fixed amount. Now if the thing that's being exchanged is a age-specific mortality rate, then we will have a something called Q-forward. And if uh, this thing, that's the, the mortality index that's being exchanged is age, is a survival probability, then we will have something called S-forward. And both of those we assume that will be linked to the general Chinese population. Okay, so building on a, uh, a Chinese-specific mortality index. Okay, either as probability or death rate. Uh, now to calibrate this head so to figure out how much we purchase, well, what's the notional amount of this Q-forward or S-forward, the standardized hedging instrument? We use a simple uh, delta hedge method. So we let FL be the future liability, Q be the hedging instrument, in this case a Q-forward. So we calculate the hedge ratio, so the amount of Q-forward, amount of the hedging instrument we had to buy by matching their first order derivative, which is just delta. So by matching that, we're able to de de determine H the required notional amount of the hatching instrument. We also make this hatch into a dynamic one. That means we will recalibrate, we recalculate this, do this equation for each time point T. Okay. And to do that, we need to overcome some nested simulation problems. We will use a, we use a approximation method to achieve or to avoid nested simulation. Now lastly is, uh, now how are we gonna evaluate this? We to find a way to know whether this hatch is doing a good job. To do that, we look at the deviation between uh, the liability being hatched and also the asset that's backing up these liability, which are defined as PLT and PAT. So we look at the deviation between that, them. If the deviation is large, that means there's a large amount of risk that's not being uh, eliminated by the hatch. If the deviation is small, then the hatch is good. In terms of numbers, then we will calculate the hatch effectiveness as the reduction in variance. So if this number is close to one, then most of the deviation has been reduced. If it's close to zero, then it's not doing a good job. Okay, so building on this hatch setup, we can look at, now look at a numerical example for, for the hatch. Okay, these are some general basic key assumptions for my illustration. So there is a liability being hatched, 30 uh, linked to age 60 in 2014, pays $1, annuity pays $1 for 30 years. And then the experience is linked to the Chinese mortality model, Chinese national population. And then the hatch horizon, 30 years, so until there's no more liability to pay. And the, the Q4 is the hatch instrument with a time to maturity of 30 years and a reference age of 75. And we assume that the market is liquid so we can freely purchase and, uh, and sell at no cost. Okay, so these are the assumptions and here is the result, okay? These are a fan chart with two fan charts showing the distribution of the liability being hatched and the asset, uh, oh, uh, the, dis the distribution of the hatch position and the unhatch position over time. Uh, the, the x axis is time from time zero to time 30 and the y axis is uh, the deviation. And the gray fan chart is showing the unhatched position and the, gre the green fan chart is showing the hatched position. It's clear from the, by comparing the width of these two fan charts, we see that uh, the variation, the deviation has greatly reduced by this hatch. Okay, the width of the gray fan chart has reduced to the green one. And now in terms of numbers, the hatch effect is showing on top of the plot at time 30 is 0 0.78, about 80%, which means that about 80% of the variance has been reduced by implementing 
a standard, standardized hatch like this on the Chinese, on the annuity linked to China's general population. Now, in a Bayesian setup, we can also investigate different source of uncertainty. Okay, because in Bayesian setup, we can separate the uncertainty from trend risk, parameter risk, and sampling risk. Okay, by doing that, we can also generate different plots, different, same, same, same type of plot for different level of risk. On the left hand side, the very leftmost plot that is showing that just trend risk. We assume that there is only longevity trend risk in this portfolio. If that's the case, then the hatch effectiveness is almost perfect, almost one. That means the hatch is almost perfect. Well, this makes sense because the hatch was designed to remove trend risk. And if there's only trend risk, then all of the risks are reduced or are gone. Now, the middle one is showing that if we put parameter risk into it, if now we have both trend risk and parameter risk. Well, earlier, I showed you in the model, we see that there is a large amount of parameter risk in it, in this uh, situation. And here, it's also reflected here with a 0 0.97 hatch effectiveness, saying that there is an impact of uh, the, 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 the parameter risk has an impact on the hatch effectiveness here. And lastly, is uh, if I put all sorts of uncertainty into the hatch, then we see uh, the hatch effect is reduced to about 0 0.78 uh, 79, which is also the plot I showed you earlier, with all risk taken into account. Okay, now in the very last, last part, uh, I will talk about this uh, longevity resolvency capital under CROs. Uh, first, what is CROs? Well, CRO stands for China Risk Warranted Solvency System. Okay, it was, uh, in a nutshell, it's just the Chinese version of Solvency II. Okay, it was proposed uh, by the Chinese government and implemented in 2015, officially released. And like Solvency II, CRO is also a th three pillar system okay, for regulating the insurance uh, industry. So here is a plot showing the structure of it. The very first pillar is a, something called a quantitative, quantitative capital requirements, which requires each Chinese insurer to hold, a, uh, to hold or to calculate and then hold a specific minimum capital requirement known as MCR okay, for uh, quanti quantifiable risks. The, in this case, including uh, both mortality risk and longevity risk. So both, for both mortality risk and longevity risk, the zero, the zero requires the insurer to hold, or to calculate and then hold a minimum capital requirement. Okay. There's also the second pillar, which is a quantitative uh, pillar, and then also the third one, which is talk about market disciplines, which are not the focus here. I will only focus on the very first one, and more specifically focus on mortality risk and longevity risk, and how to calculate the MCR, the minimal capital requirement for those two risks. Now let's uh, first look at how the MCRM is calculated. Uh, this is calculated the difference in value between uh, the, best, uh, the best estimated situation and the, another situation, the one with an average uh, scenario factor. Okay, your M, the big M, uh, the, bo the bold of M is the best estimated mortality curve and SFM stands for the adverse scenario factors for more high risk. Okay, and this is saying that if the number of insurers is less than 100, then the scenario factor is 20%, so it shocked the mortality rate by 20%. And if it's more than 200, it shocks by 10%. And then we calculate the difference between those to get the minimum capital requirement for mortality risk, okay, just for mortality risk. Now for longevity risk, the idea is sim similar, but using a different set of uh, average scenario uh, factor. A little bit more complicated, but this simply is just saying that you assume that for the first five years, zero T from zero to five, uh, the improvement rate is 3%, and then for the next five to 10 years, 2%, and, and then 1% afterwards for the next 10 years, and no more for the after 20 years. So yeah, these are the assumptions made by zeros, which will be used uh, to calculate um, uh, the minimum capital requirement for longevity risk. Okay. 
Now, the CROS also considers the correlation between mortality risk and longevity risk. So they require, so to calculate the MCR for both mortality risk and longevity risk, they use a matrix format, format to do that with a correlation, a correlation of zero minus 0 0.25, considering the negative uh, correlation between mortality risk and longevity risk. So when calculating MCR for both longevity and mortality risk, we use uh, this type of uh, calculation. Now, finally, to to the uh, to the results. Okay, building on the hatch example I showed you, had the illustration, the numerical illustration I showed you earlier, and I calculated MCR for both longevity risk and mortality risk. Here, the unhatch liability has an MCR of about 0 0.7. And then for the hatching instrument, the Q-forwards, the fuel build portfolio for the Q-forwards, it also has an MCR of about the same size, 0 0.7, 0 0.63. However, if we combine these two together into a hatched precision, okay, the unhatched liability with the hatching instrument into a hatched precision, then we see that the MCR, the minimum capital requirement for the hatch liability reduced to 0 0.067, uh, which is about 10, 10, 10 times smaller than the unhatched situation. And as we're saying that implementing this hatch will help the insurer to reduce its minimal capital requirement from 0 0.7 to 0 0.07, almost 10 times smaller. What is the unit, 0 .7, what is the unit? The unit is the liability, the dollar, dollar amount. The dollar amount, I assume, uh, in my assumptions, which is a $1 annuity. Yes. Payment for 30 years. Yes. 30 years. 60, 60 years old for 30 years. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, that's all the results and conclusions, some concluding remarks. Okay. And in this um, paper, we try to overcome uh, three three uh, problems in managing longevity risk in China. Okay. Uh, one is how to, uh, how to model the Chinese mortality based on the Chinese mortality, uh, histor historical mortality rates. And second is uh, to build a hedging strategy on top of this uh, model that can, uh, that's using Chinese index, Chinese uh, index, a mortality index specifically designed for China. And lastly, we want to see whether this type of hatch will be useful for Chinese insurers under the newly proposed uh, CROS regulation. Okay, so uh, first we develop a stochastic model to use that to quantify uh, the longevity risk that's faced by Chinese insurers. And second, we build a model that was able to remove a minimal full amount of longevity risk with both trend risk, parameters, and error uh, risk taken into account. And lastly, we demonstrate, I demonstrate numerically how implementing such a hatch can help a Chinese, re, uh, Chinese insurer to reduce its uh, CROS minimum capital requirement, MCR, uh, which making a strong case for introducing a standardized longevity transfer market in China. And that's everything I have. Yeah, thank you, Kenneth. Miraculously, spot on 30 minutes. Wonderful. Yes. Just one moment. Please. Do we have any uh, questions? I'll allow one or two questions while he's standing here and the next speaker uh, taking his breath. Any immediate question? Yes, Stephen, please. Thank you very much, Kenneth, for an excellent presentation. Really enjoyed it. Uh, just one quick question. When you went, the modeling approach that you're using is a, a Lee Carter approach. Yes, I correct. just wonder if you could give any insights as to whether or not there are any birth cohort effects being seen in the population mortality within China? Mm. Yes. In terms of birth, birth uh, um, cohort effect, um, one thing I have to say that is that the data, well, you see the data is only 20-some years. So the number of cohorts in there, not, not that many. But from that, that, that little number of uh, cohort effects, there seems to be a cohort effect. There seems to be a cohort effect, but it's hard to actually verify with such short amount of data with it. 
So I cannot say whether there's, uh, I cannot test whether there's really cohort effect in this Lee Carter model, but it seems to be there is uh, the case. So maybe we can further investigate when we have longer uh, data sets. Thank you, Kenneth. Another point is that uh, knowing the problems of data in China, you have 1%, you no, know, you have 100%, 1%, 0.1%. Mm. I think it would be useful if you could make the, your imputed data available because he has done a lot of work to fill in this missing information so that the rest of the community can use different models to detect, you know, your question of cohorts, there are different other models, uh, P-spline or whatever models, to, to uh, help understand mm. the historical trend in China. I think it would be, right. so would be adding to it. So input the data yes. is also very helpful to detect cohorts. Yes. yes. Right. Thank you. Yes. May I invite the next speaker, Jonathan, here, yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for coming. My name is Jonathan uh, from Sydney University of New South Wales. I'll be presenting my joint work with my colleagues, uh, Professor Mike Sheris, who is on the audience, Andres Vijegas, and also Kevin Cryer. And I'll be presenting on a talk which is a bit related to the one we have just listened to. The main difference might be on our approach. We are more like taking the global op our perspective on how we can uh, come up with uh, a market through which uh, longevity-linked uh, liabilities can be uh, traded just the way uh, we experience with, say, equities market, etc. So the title of my talk, as you can see, is we are proposing a value-based longevity risk uh, index uh, for hedging any retirement income portfolios. The title of my, uh, the structure of my talk will be as follows. I will start off with a brief uh, motivation, which I assume most of you are familiar with. And then I will propose the index, uh, which will constitute of two main parts, uh, the mortality bit and the financial market bit. We are trying to quantify all the various sources of risk that a typical insurer uh, might face. So this may be one of the key uh, sort of the, um, difference with the prior presentation. Uh, from the prior presentation, the purely focused on mortality risk. Here we are saying over and above mortality risk, there are other sorts of risk. You have got an annuity portfolio, which is basically the liability values or you, you are exposed to other sources of risk like uh, financial market or uh, say the fluctuation in interest rates, etc. So we'll try to combine all such sources of risk. And then we will go, I will present a typical liability portfolio, uh, pro portfolio for an uh, insurer or a retirement income provider. In the case where they don't hedge their position. And then I will then assess with if they happen to say to use our framework in hedging, what is the uh, risk reduction associated with combining the unhedged position with uh, some hedge instruments. And we we'll illustrate uh, with a typical example of a swap, which is pretty much similar to the previous stock. So I will go through the hedging framework and then present some, a series of numerical results uh, which I tend to illustrate how our framework works and its effectiveness. Uh, as I said, retirement income providers are now heavily pro uh, exposed to longevity risk uh, due to uh, sort of um, people living to old age. And also one key approach 
for hedging this longevity risk as you have been uh, watching, especially from North America and, uh, and, and Europe. There have been a rising uh, sort of level of magnitude of uh, reinsurance transactions associated with uh, longevity linked instruments. And according to literature, there is a school of thought that the global um, uh, the reinsurer's capacity will sort of uh, reach a limit. That is, there has been an increasing trend in longevity-linked uh, transactions, but it will come a time where that reinsurance market will say enough is enough. That is, they won't have the capacity of keeping on absorbing that uh, sort of uh, risk. And then there is, re there is need for coming up with alternative solutions which are transparent, which are efficient, through which instead of engaging in reinsurance transactions, there can be maybe a capital market through which this risk can be efficiently traded. So we are following up from other prior literature who we have been sort of advocating for the development of a more efficient longevity risk transfer uh, market. So far, as I said, there's been two, most of the transaction has been uh, indemnity based through insurers or uh, engaging with reinsurers. And there are sort of so many drawbacks associated with uh, customized edges, one of which is the issue of capacity and disclosure among uh, new portfolios. Uh, they are very complex for, say, capital markets to analyze the tr any given transaction. There's lack of transparency. And also, usually, when they are customized edges, they are also associated with high transaction costs. Yes, there are various layers of, uh, say, individuals or, or structures which needs to be put in place for such indemnity-based uh, transactions to be efficient. So what we, another approach, which is one we are sort of more inclined to, is the, div, uh, the development of a, a more standardized aging platform. That is a creation of a more standard market and exchange for longevity linked uh, transactions. Uh, and there's been sort of strong support or some prior literature supporting the, uh, that is, uh, standardized edges, that is the, how effective they can be and sort of highlighting many advantages associated with longevity, uh, standardized longevity edges. So what we are trying to do in this talk is, is to come up with a more standardized framework, which we call a value-based longevity index. We call it value-based as in we structure is based on the value, the, the true values of the liabilities. And you would know that the way we formulate our problem is there is also basis risk which will come up because you have got an annuity book or in a, uh, a provider's book and there is an index. So the book, usually, the book size will be way smaller than the, uh, the population size which is used in creating the index. So the mismatch in the population size and the book size and also the profile of individuals constituting the book is in most of the cases different from the profile of the population. So the, that mismatch results in basis risk. I will then present a consistent of approach in which how we can minimize that basis risk. So in short, we are proposing a value-based longevity index and then I will then present, show to you how the resulting basis risk which arises in such a situation can be efficiently uh, sort of mitigated or can be reduced. So the structure of our value-based index is very simple. We are considering uh, we are, the value of the uh, index is simply the discounted expected value of a, a stream of payments. We can think of 
uh, say we've got uh, a group of retirees, a cohort retiring aged either skist or skist five, and the provider, the annuity provider, is promising a stream of say one a unit of longevity and inflation-linked income stream as long as that cohort is alive. So we are simply saying that X year is the initial age, T is the time at which uh, the contract is being valued or the portfolio is being valued, Omega is the maximum age of the last survivor. So we are saying this is simply uh, S times P, where S is the survivor probability of the population underlying the index. As I said, we assume, say, a national population to be that underlying our index, and this is simply the, end of the present value of inflation in indexed income stream of $1 per annum. So the value of the index is simply the sum of this throughout as long as uh, the course code uh, is alive. So as I said, this is the survival probability, and this is the uh, the real present value of income stream. So I will, in the next uh, few minutes, I will go through how we construct our survivor, how we come up with our survival probabilities, and also how we find uh, the bond prices. So the first part will be on the survival probabilities, that is our mortality model. For our mortality model, since here we are saying the insurer has got a book and we are writing our index on a population. So we have got, we can think of it as we've got two subpopulations, the national population, which we call the reference population, and the book population, which might be the insurer's uh, annuitants. So between these uh, two subpopulations, or these two populations, there may be some common factors deriving the dynamics of the two, so the, so the common factor captures the dependence between the two populations, and there will be some population-specific factors. You can think of it of idiosyncratic risk. So we are saying this is the book population-specific factor, which only impacts the book population, and this is the reference population-specific factors. So in short, we have got what we call a joint mortality model, a two-factor mortality model, which is where there is a common factor capturing the dependence between the two and those population-specific factors. And if you think of it again, the way we formulate it, our mortality model is decomposable in that we can come up with a single mortality model just for the reference population and that for the book population alone. So we are using, uh, we formally, we are quantifying the dynamics, our, that is the common factor, the population specific factors. Uh, we assume that they are, it's driven by uh, what is called an affine, by some affine processes, such that the average force of mortality, that is the average force of mortality for the reference population is a function of the common factor and the reference population specific factor. Likewise, the average, uh, mortality for the book population, again, is a function of the common factor and the book population. And this C, R, X, and B, X, T are all evolved in a stochastic fashion through time. And we assume that the, the dynamics is detected by an affine type processes. They are detected by what are called affine type processes. These are just Gaussian processes which detect uh, that is the general evolution of the factors through time from the time you start observing up until, say, the entire code is uh, wiped out. And again, the way we formulate for simplicity, we assume that all the three factors which are driving our population dynamics are independent uh, with each other. This is more like for convenience, and also we have performed some empirical tests where we've show, we, we, we can actually show that this mode of formulation fits empirically fit well to the data which we, uh, that is, we, we fitted to the model. With this, so with this average force of mortality, we can 
as we'll come up, the nice feature about the, this modeling framework is we can come up with a very uh, simple cross form expression for our survivor probabilities, that is for the reference population and the book population. So here, these factors B1, B2, and A are symbol algebraic functions, which makes the assumption of that affine feature assumption very sort of um, convenient, as in we, it aids in coming up with very simple cross-form expression for the sort of for the factors deriving uh, the, re the survival probabilities for both the reference population and the book population. So that was it for the survival probabilities. So we formulate the survival probabilities assuming that the mortality dynamics evolve in a, uh, af in a stochastic fashion according to affine processes. So the next part of the index is uh, the discount, that the, the bond prices, which are in real terms. So again, for the bond price, we assume what is called the dynamic nelson Seagull model. So uh, this dynamic nelson Seagull model, the beauty of it is the yield curve across all maturities can again be represented in sort of in, in explicit form. Similar to the survival probability uh, underlying factors, we are saying the yield function or the yield curve, which matures the yield with a maturity of tau. Tau can be, say, one month, two months, up to 30 year maturities. In our case, we use the US uh, data, treasury data, where yields are provided from, say, one month up until 30 year maturities. So we are saying the yields across all maturities are driven by the general level of the yield curve, which is L, the slope, and the curvature. So if you look at the shape of the yield curve, you would find that there's a general level which is sort of detecting the, the, the level of the yields, and also there is uh, some elements of slope, and also there are some curvature elements and all these factors, again, for flexibility, we are assuming that they follow affine diffusion processes, which uh, can be expressed in stochastic differential form uh, by that system uh, of equations. So the beauty of this is once you have got uh, sort of an explicit form representation of the yield curve, we can as well find the corresponding bond prices in, in cross form so that in the end, we have got a value-based index, which is a function of a cross-form survival function and a cross-form bond prices. Just to illustrate uh, sort of uh, the effectiveness of this uh, arbitrary, the, the dynamic nelson Seagull model, we downloaded the data, the treasury data from uh, the US Treasury. Uh, we downloaded the nominal yields and also the real yields. So you'd find that the blue line is our feet, that is our, um, the, the, the red dots are the observed yields across uh, all maturities, and we fitted our model to those ob observed mu. As you can see, there is, there is a strong empirical fit for both the nominal yields and also the real yields, as you can, as evidenced by these two figures. Now, I move on to uh, a typical liability that an insurer might be having. So now we've got our value-based longevity index. Now, let's think of an insurer who is not aged. He has got uh, a set of liability. He is exposed to the risk of paying one dollar, a stream of one dollar annual payment to a court as long as uh, they are alive. So as you can see, we are saying the present value of an unhedged position is the sum of the number of survivors or the number of annuitants times the present value of that uh, income stream. Likewise, omega is the maximum age, and we are assuming that the payments start, say, at retirement. So this can be an insurer with a, uh, a, um, an initial book, price, uh, book size of, say, 100,000 annuitants. So you are saying as long as each annuitant is alive, 
you'll be paying one dollar of in inflation indexed income per annum as long as they are alive. And we also, we, we assemble some debts that is through time, uh, annuitants will be leaving the system and we separate that according to, we use what is called binomial assembling for all the debts. So, assuming that the insurer doesn't do any form of kind of aging, this is a typical liability profile or this is a typical histogram that can, uh, we can use to quantify how the distribution of uh, such liabilities. Uh, I don't know whether you can, uh, easy note that, but you can see that there is a, a degree of positive skewness that is there is more like uh, long tail, uh, right tail risk, that risk of people living longer, or annuitants living longer than initially forecasted at, uh, in the onset. So here we just simulated, we assumed that our portfolio has got 100,000 lives a time, zero, and we performed about 10,000 simulations for both the mortality model and also the, 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 yield, the yield curve which we use for bond prices. So now, if the insurer doesn't age, this is the risk that they will be facing. I will elaborate more when I present some numerical results that is at, uh, in, uh, some results comparing the unhedged position with various levels of hedging that the insurer can think of. So for hedging, we are assuming that there may be a swap in the market that will be trading. So as you can see, we assume that the insurer can uh, enter into a fixed uh, a, a, into a swap where they will be paying fixed because they want uh, the, the insurer's objective is to have certainty on the, uh, on the payments they'll be making so they can enter a structure where they pay fixed and receive uh, the realized uh, rates in the event that if the mortality rates are lower than originally planned, they can receive uh, some payments from the swap. Otherwise, they pay the fixed. So here we are saying the present value of the swap is the realized value minus the forward value, of course, times the discount factor. Here we are assuming that the discount factor, one will be using some nominal interest rates. So the present value of the swap is that. And of course, this is a typical profile of such uh, swap payments. Again, we performed uh, some 10,000 simulations. As you can see, these uh, a, a fixed payer uh, swap, uh, this is a fixed payer swap. So the average uh, in the long term is just uh, zero, and there are some deviations around zero. If they are, if they are more survivors, that means they fixed, uh, uh, the, the, the annuitant, uh, the, the provider will be paying. If they are more less survivors, it's the other way around. So now we want to assess some scenarios. Given our hedged uh, instrument and an hedged position, we want now to come up with a series of tests. We want to assess the effectiveness of an, a hedged position against those unhedged positions. We will first assume that what happens if, say, the insurer, this is how we construct the hedge. The hedge position is simply uh, the unhedged position plus the swap, which is basically, that is the unhedged position. This omega naught is simply more like what the number of swaps which are required for a perfect edge, <coughs> or close to perfect edge. And we obtain that by numerical optimization, that is when we are performing our numerical experiments. Now I'll move on to the best risk metric. As I said, when the provider is sort of trading or is um, using, say, these products in aging, they've got their book population, and there is a national population, the reference population, which, and the two populations have got different characteristics. And we, I will present a metric through which we can quantify how the basis risk can be 
uh, reduced or can be mitigated or can be managed. In our analysis, we will compare with the various levels of aging. We assume that more like similar to the first talk, uh, to the first, uh, our, the, the, the first talk, the first case is if the insurer is just hedging, say, longevity risk and not worrying about uh, uh, inflation or uh, other sources of financial risk. So the index will be like this without uh, the discount factor. What if their insurer is only hedging his position, the longevity risk and the nominal interest rates and not worrying about inflation? And the index I presented is more like a fully aged index where you consider all the various sources of, of risk. And now, so if the insurer ages only uh, longevity risk, this is the kind of uh, profile we, you generate. So the, the, the distribution of the enhanced position is the blue one and the orange color is the longevity risk, uh, that is the risk reduction when you only age longevity risk. And this is where you use nominal, uh, lin a nominal in linked index, that is where you use nominal interest rates in mitigating your risk. And this is more like the fully hedged risk. All these three uh, sort of figures can better be explained by this uh, box whisk of plot, where we are saying if the position is unhedged, you can see it has got the standard deviation around the mean is way higher than where you only hedge, uh, say, longevity risk. As you can see, there is a uh, risk reduction associated with uh, only hedging uh, the longevity risk. And when you hedge both longevity risk and nominal risk, you further reduce uh, this further risk reduction uh, with the maximum risk reduction achieved by a fully hedged index. So what we are simply saying is the more risk factors you, uh, you propose or you, you target to reduce, the better the hedge effectiveness. And this can be further explained by this metric. Here we propose a longevity risk reduction metric, which is basically uh, this row in our case, we assume that it, this is uh, the variance. So what we are saying is, you, this is the H index where one uses the survivor index only, the nominal index, and the full uh, H value. So we are assessing the effectiveness, the longevity risk reduction, as you increase the book size, that is the size of your, uh, your, 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 your liability book. The first case is where you've got 1,000 survivors or 1,000 annuitants in your book. When you're only aging longevity risk, the maximum longevity risk reduction we achieved was about 31%, or the maximum risk reduction is 31%. That is where you ignore uh, either inflation or other source of risk. As you add uh, more annuitants, that is with the book size, initial book size of 10,000, you can see the uh, risk reduction also increase. And in our case, given the numerical experiments we performed, the maximum risk reduction we achieved with a book size of 100,000 was 58%. Now, when you add on top of longevity risk, you also hedge nominal risk. You would see that you get a fair, Im slightly improved uh, sort of uh, edge efficiency as in the maximum longevity uh, risk reduction will be something like 74%, and with a fully hedge index, and with 100,000 annuitants, the maximum longevity risk reduction was close to 85%. To put that into perspective, this is how um, the hedge efficiency uh, sort of uh, um, diminish, there is more like uh, as you increase the book size, the edge efficiency also increase, but up to a certain level, which we say that's more like the diminishing point. And it has been quantified in other prior literature like the Vijegas et al., which was uh, published in the, by the Faculty of Actuaries, that there will be 
some other uh, risk factors like democratic risk factors which makes up for the remainder of the risk. And this is pretty much my talk. There are some limitations, of course. Uh, the book population we used, uh, we used maximum age. We assumed that the maximum age was 90, but it's now realistic that many people, size of a population is living up to, say, 100. And also, we, um, we used static aging techniques in our aging strategy. It would be worthwhile, say, for future research to consider dynamic aging. Uh, and also, of course, I want to acknowledge financial support from the Society of Actuaries and also the uh, Australian Research Council. Thank you for listening. Those are my contacts. Any questions? Immediate questions for Jonathan? No, thank you. Um, thanks. Just you can ask question later on. Um, thank you, both speakers, for your hard work, and I congratulate uh, the authors for your careful thoughts and innovative use of, the, of advanced statistics to answer some of these key questions for this that is relevant to this conference, which is uh, how do you quantify uncertainty around longevity risk? And they have taken a step further on how do we hedge them using an index. And I'm going to comment as a practitioner. Uh, both authors have mentioned uh, the Life and Longevity Market Association which is formed to, uh, to accelerate and to, to promote the liquid transaction of longevity risk. And so my comment is from that area. We, we have the same aim to try to promote that. But I also need to say that after 10 years of a lot of work from a lot of people, we have not seen a liquid longevity risk yet. So some of my comments is, is with that uh, connotation. I don't want to start... Uh, jumping and, and dancing around, we have a solution. No, we haven't, because we haven't seen a, a wide uh, liquid market yet. I will start from commenting on Jonathan's uh, presentation. Um, the authors have solved some, a big problem. Uh, the, the, the authors have proposed a way to hedge uh, China's growing longevity risk, and they have aimed to solve the big problem, uh, which is the data problem, we see that some of, of those 30 years of analysis, some years have 100% of data, and some years have 1%, and other years have 0.1%, and there are some ages that are missing. Uh, they have proposed a way, which is published elsewhere, not here, a way to impute this missing data. And in this piece of work, they have um, generated, parameterized the mortality rates and trends from the imputed data. Um, and from there, they propose a stochastic model, and f with the stochastic model, they can then have, s through a series of assumptions, to hedge longevity risk. And the conclusion is that you can, uh, you can potentially reduce the capital requirements by up to 90% in your paper, and you mentioned 80%. Um, just comments on how do we take this forward. Um, the, it has a math mathematical framework, but for it to be accepted and to be widespread, to be used in, in, a, in a wide, uh, to be widely used, I think it needs to overcome some uh, challenges. Uh, the first is the industry and academics will need to have some consensus over what is actually the historical mortality rates and trends of China. My understanding, I went to China twice, my understanding is that there's, there's, there still hasn't, we still don't have a consensus. Is it 4% per annum in the last decade, or is it 2%, is it 1%? Um, I think your work can be promoted to actually generate debate uh, if, if your data, your imputed data, uh, can be shared widely, and more people use different methods to analyze that data set. Uh, they will answer some of the questions uh, that Stephen asked, you know, the, is the, um, the cohort trends and historical uh, mortality improvement uh, rates. And the second areas that it needs to overcome is how does the industry describe the future rates of mortality improvement? Yep. Do they use annual rates of mortality improvement? 
uh, or is it the UK? UK has got a CMI uh, framework that everybody uh, can, can talk about. You know, we need a, a common currency before we can discuss, before we can trade. So those two problems need to be, uh, to be resolved. Um, and then, of course, the, the projection, everything else will follow. A third area that needs to be understood well, which is the, uh, the minimum uh, requirements, the, the, uh, the capital requirements that you need. From what you have shown me, if I understood it correctly, uh, your calculation is saying that for one billion US dollar, I need to have 1.7 billion dollars, the 70 percent, to back my liability. Is that right? The MCR? Is that what it? No. Can you? Yeah. So, so I, I think I think that needs to be understood. And before that, uh, um, yeah, it's again, it's very difficult to understand the value of your 80 percent. 80 percent of what? How much money is that? 90 percent of what? Um, so I, I and and also once um, <clears throat> once we have all these in place, and I look forward to. Um, Actually, I do look forward to further engagement of your paper with actuaries to understand uh, the, the, the mathematics around it, the benefits around it, uh, before we can take it on. Uh, the second paper um, has aims to contribute to literature in three ways. Uh, it aims to propose a new mortality framework that allows for the population feature and, and also the reference population and also the, the insured population feature and the trends and so on. And it aims to introduce uh, the real interest rate hedging into the index because previous indices are just mainly about mortality. And you also try to look at the uh, continuous, the differences between continuous and time discrete differences and you show that there's not a lot of difference. Um, I just highlight a few good features in your models that, that will be suitable for the indexation that you are, we are talking about. Um, the first is that your models aims to take account of death rates in the two population, your reference population, which is usually the general population, U.S. census data, and also your, your insured population, because the death rates of these two populations are usually very different. Yep, the annuitants are usually lower. And your model aims to look at the trend is different as well. And many other models miss this out. I think this is a, a good feature. Your model also tries to look at features that can move these two populations. Yep, for, if, if, for example, if everybody starts to take the growth hormones and all these hormones, and if the rich and poor can have them, if it's widely available, then you will affect these two populations. So, so you, you take account of these two. Um, but, and, and you mentioned that um, your model allows for some of the basis risk that the LMA is concerned about. I think it only allows for small parts. We, 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 we were not that concerned about how big or small the portfolio. I think we feel that we understand that, and you have demonstrated it quite well. What we were more concerned about is the demographic risk. We want to know, is it, pop, is it possible that the population have a different mortality trend from your reference population? Yeah? If the annuitants are more sophisticated, they are wealthier, they have more money to buy these new pills, they may have a faster mortality improvement. So that is the worry that we had. But from the papers, I, I don't get the impression that it has been addressed. Um, and of course, there's the uh, potential work going forward, given that you have the parameters to address them. We will be very interested uh, to understand how do you calibrate that? Yep. How do you calibrate people in different socioeconomic groups? You have only allowed them, and what is the, the impact on that? Um, you have also introduced yield and real interest yield to show that you can reduce um, hedging. You can hedge more and more by introducing more parameters. I think that is a good feature, but because um, there's a lot of hedges out there that is quite uh, economically... Uh, viable things like interest rate swaps and inflation swaps. 
I, I wonder if, if they do, do they need another hedge when you have something that's so transparent and tradable already? Um, in, uh, I think for this to go to the next step to be used widely, again, I think we need more engagement with practitioners. Uh, it also needs to demonstrate whether it meets the objectives of risk managers, the pension funds. If the pension fund says, all I, want to, all I care about is I want to close this and, and pass it on, and hedging doesn't do that um, because, because the risk just goes away. This, this doesn't go away. You still have some residual basis risk. And it also needs to ask whether it is cost-effective relative to current solutions. In your papers, you did mention that there are solutions. We can reinsure it. Uh, we can actually uh, do buyouts, buy-in for if you are pension funds, and and the question is always boils down to the commercial viability, and that needs to be understood more. And even when once we have understood that, that needs to be explained better, because my experience with dealing with this is that the the, the senior management will say, uh, I've already got uh, a reinsurance treaty. I just press this button, it goes. And with this, we, you need to take it to a bank, you need to trade, and you need to form a special vehicles and, and all this. This is quite complicated. I think that needs to, uh, to be resolved. I think there's a mental block there to, to jump onto the new solution. Um, so all the best to the authors. I think it's a tremendous amount of careful thoughts and new work has been introduced here. I look for it, for it, for it to be developed and eventually used. Thank you.